Broadcasting. And replacing it with six, and so it leaves all these gaps where pillars okay. are cutting the roof. So it's not about the roof per se; it's just about the AC. Yeah, it's more about the AC in that one. And yeah. Spend a lot of money catching things, but just to redo the whole roof. It would cost more money just to say. <clears throat> Time it really would. Yeah. Okay. Yes, so. Unless somebody comes with an arsenal. Yep. I think so. So they try to talk like, where's the other tripod? Well, we should not tripping over the tripod. <laughs> Justin is uh, doing a belly flop. Sorry, we're just talking about the tripod that's not behind you anymore. Oh, okay. <laughs> right? It's in the, in the ceiling. Anyway. We're getting fancy. I'd like to call to order this Board of Commissioner meeting. The date is Tuesday, October 27th. Communication today is by Commissioner Holtfloor. Please rise for that and the Pledge of Allegiance. Are you part of me, please? Our Father, we come before you this afternoon and we ask for your help with this pandemic crisis. It were the people who have lost relatives, friends, or are sick themselves. Help those who are trying to find an answer to controlling this crisis. Please be with our county employees, our police departments, our first responders, our fire departments. Protect them as they put their lives on the line for us daily. Be with our country, its leaders, and its citizens. Walk alongside each of us as we vote in the upcoming election. <clears throat> now we ask for wisdom for our board as we make decisions that will affect our entire county. All these things we ask in thy name alone. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Mr. Roebuck, would you call the roll, please? Yes, sir. Mr. Garcia. Here. Mr. Bauman. Here. Mr. Zylstra. Here. Mr. Dannenberg. Here. Mr. Meppelink. Here. Mr. Terpstra. Here. Mr. Holtlor. Here. Mr. Kyers. Here. Mr. Bergman. Here. And Mr. Fenske. Here. Mr. Chair, we have a quorum. Presentation of petitions and communications. I do have one, Mr. Chair. Okay. Then from Iowa Area Intermediate School District, and it is a statement um, from our Ottawa Area Superintendents. Since the onset of the pandemic, Ottawa Area Superintendents and other school leaders 
have appreciated the support and cooperation of the Ottawa County Department of Public Health. Their partnership has been invaluable as we work in tandem to reduce and prevent transmission of COVID-19 in our schools and communities. We believe this collaboration has allowed us to keep the number of classroom related cases low, making school one of the safest places for students to be. That is all from us. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question, Mr. Chairman. Um, the clerk, did you read all the names? Pardon me? Did you read all the names of the commissioners? Justin. Yes. I, I, I thought, Justin, I thought you missed my name. Maybe it wasn't uh, listening closely <laughs> enough. <laughs> I apologize, Mr. DeYoung. <laughs> <laughs> you are right. <laughs> He is here. Uh, and you were my favorite commissioner. I don't know <laughs> oh! oh. <laughs> I'm <All> sorry. Right. <laughs> we have you down. Thanks. All right. Next thing on the agenda is public comment. We're now in our first public comment section. If you wish to give public comments, please wait till your name is uh, uh, read and then approach the podium. And if you're attending online, please wait until your audio button is activated. You need to provide your name and address prior to speaking, and you will have three minutes to, to make your comments. Clerk Roebuck is timing the comments and will interrupt when the three minute time period has ended. <clears throat> is a chance for commissioners to hear the public. It's not a time for a question and answer session nor is it the time for a debate between commissioners and the public. If you are here to comment on the closing of Libertas School, please know that the county will not be issuing a statement prior to the litigation of this issue, which is happening in the federal district court in Grand Rapids before Judge Maloney on Wednesday of this week. We thank you for being here in per person or online and believe it is great for the democratic process. So with that, our first public comment is from- <clears throat> And Mr. Chair, yep, I do have a, a list of folks in order who've requested. And the first one is Joel Kalman. We do have the addresses of these individuals as well on the record, so. Okay. Welcome. Hello, uh, my name is Joel Kalman, as you just said. Uh, can you hear me on the mic? <clears throat> yep. Good. Okay. My family lives in Hudsonville. Uh, we're in Kyle Turpshire's district. I own a business that is in District 7 and my children attend Libertas Christian in District 5. As Christians, we believe God has ordained civil authorities and calls us to honor them. We wanna make sure that you feel that from all of us. Let me begin by succinctly sharing why Libertas is valuable to me. It starts with a core belief that all people are made in the image of God. This means that we both love our neighbor and respect the freedom of conscience of each individual. The school educates by teaching the whole person in a truly integral approach to education. It is distinctively Christian in that it believes that all people can be in a relationship with God through faith in Christ. Let's consider three questions. First, was the press release reasonable? Let me read to you the section titled Public Reporting from the State's Outbreak Definition Document. The need to publicly report a COVID-19 outbreak in an educational setting must balance the need for public disclosure and maintaining patient privacy. Public reporting of outbreaks of significant size or risk to public health should be prioritized. What is the only other school that has received a press release from the Ottawa County Health Department? GVSU. Out of two cases at Libertas rise to the level of GVSU with over a thousand cases that would justify this press release. The way the story was crafted generated significant animosity towards Libertas in particular and Christians in general. It is probably exposed you to also similar animosity if comment sections are any indication. Fortunately for me, my email address isn't publicly available online. <laughs> Second, is it reasonable to shut down the whole school? Is it truly reasonable to assume that all students and staff are close contacts as status in the, stated in the published cease and desist order? Is it COVID until proven innocent? Even with the surge at GVSU, from what I understand, students were still allowed to attend in-person classes. Will the 
health department admit that there were no active cases at Libertas on Thursday at 9 p.m. when they quarantined the building? Third, is it reasonable to seek a court decision when threatened with imprisonment? Yes. I wonder if the health department would address that to many in the community, their actions do not look reasonable, but instead look to be retaliation for a legal dispute. Finally, as a citizen with deep roots in Ottawa County, I am interested in where the health department thinks their authority ends regarding closing businesses, schools, and churches. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Joel. Who's next? And next we have Lanson Perone. Hello, commissioners. Thank you for the opportunity to speak briefly regarding the Libertas school shutdown. As you said, my name is Lanson Perrin. I'm the father of five young children, three of whom attend Libertas. I've lived and worked in Ottawa County for the past 15 years. As a first year Libertas parent, I was shocked to find out last Friday that the school was closed in quarantine. The order given to Libertas finding imminent danger to the public health is simply not true. As an engineer and one who's followed the COVID-19 pandemic closely, I want to provide a perspective regarding some recent data that's come out about schools, children, and the coronavirus. Two articles, both written within the last week from the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal show how relatively unaffected school-aged children are. Just prior to this meeting, I emailed all of you a copy of these articles for your reference. First, from the New York Times. The bulk of evidence suggests only limited transmission from young children to adults. Months into the school year, school reopenings across the United States remain a patchwork of plans. In-person, remote and hybrid, masked and not, socially distanced and not. But amid this jumble, one clear pattern is emerging. Schools do not seem to be stoking community transmission of the coronavirus. We see a similar pattern in places where they're doing nothing at schools. So I find that fascinating, said Dr. Brooke Nichols, an infectious disease modeler. Sadly, what Dr. Nichols finds fascinating, the Ottawa County Health Department finds criminal. The science matters, the data matters. Next from the Wall Street Journal, the CDC has reported that nationwide there have been 74 COVID deaths of children. As a point of comparison, in the most recent flu season, the CDC estimates 434 flu deaths of children. A death of any child is tragic. Yet we don't shut down schools over the flu. And we certainly don't declare imminent danger in threatening letters. As we move closer to home in Ottawa County, there have been over 1,000 COVID cases in children with zero child deaths. This is fantastic news. And Libertas has had less than five total cases, staff and students included, all of whom have recovered. While there is much to learn regarding the relative immunity of children, the data from around the world, in the US, and certainly Ottawa County, agree that this is not a pandemic for children. As a parent and community member who loves and sacrifices for my children every day, this shutdown is completely unsupported by the data. Libertas doesn't have any active cases. They have been forthcoming in communication with parents about <coughs> cases and exposure, and they have continued to love and teach my children. The rest of the world has prioritized children in education and open schools full time. It's time for Ottawa County to do the same. In closing, I have a question for your consideration. Given the extensive research and data surrounding children in COVID, is the Ottawa County Health Department acting reasonably in shutting Libertas? Thank you for your time and I appreciate your service to this community. Thank you. Next is Elsie Mason. My name is Elise Mason. I'm a senior at Libertas Christian School. I reside in District 4, and my commissioner is Alan Vandenberg. Dear Board of Commissioners, thank you for hearing me today. Last Thursday night, my school was shut down by the Ottawa County Health Department. I think it may be beneficial for you to hear my point <coughs> of view as a student at Libertas and how the Health Department's decision has affected not only myself, but the entire student body at Libertas. I have been so thankful to be back in school with my peers and teachers this fall. We have been blessed to experience a normal learning environment and an enriching education. 
We have in-person classes, worship during chapel services, and a true sense of community. The leadership at Libertas has put in place responsible measures to keep us healthy and safe while continuing to preserve the most effective learning environment. The abrupt closure of our school has been difficult for everyone connected to the Libertas community. Teachers have not been able to access their record books or teaching materials, and students cannot get into the building to get textbooks and assignments. At this point, we have no way to continue our education. The extreme action that was taken by the health department and the exaggerated and accusatory language that they used in the press release insinuated that the school is a danger to the surrounding community. The stigma that is now attached to Libertas is not only damaging to the school, but to each individual student, parent, and administrator who are only seeking to make the best decisions for the school community. I have experienced this personally for myself and younger siblings who have been approached multiple times by community members who have negative comments or questions about our school. We had no desire to become the center of this type of attention. We want the freedom to humbly pursue our calling to learn and to teach in our small Christian school. I am praying that a decision is reached that will protect the individual rights and religious freedoms of, of River Catholic students and teachers. Thank you so much for this opportunity for me to share my testimony. Thanks, Elise. And next we have Allie Norman. And Ellie, um, I'm sorry, Ellie, um, <coughs> you speak clearly into the microphone. Apparently we're having some audio issues, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. The cord. My name is Allie Norman, and I'm a resident of Ottawa County, residing in District 5, with Randy Methelink as my commissioner. I'm also a ninth grade student at Libertas Christian School. Libertas has offered me an education of the highest caliber. While most people know how to think, my instructors and teachers strive each day to train me how to think in a logical and cohesive way. I have been taught how to examine arguments while not accepting them, have respectful conversations with people who have differing opinions, and communicate my beliefs in a clear and compelling manner. Equipped with these tools, the current student body, student body of Libertas will be able to impact the society where these traits are not always practiced or valued. Another aspect of the classical education, which my school provides for me, is to cultivate a love of learning. When I started Libertas in sixth grade, I absolutely despised math. It was not my favorite subject. This year in ninth grade, I'm happy to say geometry is one of my favorite subjects and I'm enjoying it so much. And I attribute this to the fact that I've been taught how to love to learn and math is no longer seen as a struggle, but an enjoyable challenge that I can learn to overcome. The facet of this love for learning comes from an understanding that all subjects were, were created by God. At Libertas, we learn God is not only the God of theology, but also the God of science, math, logic, English, history, the arts, and everything else. For any subject to be taught separate from the view that all stems from him is plagiarism against the eternal judge. In contrast, if I was placed in the public education system, I would be taught that all subjects are man's capital, capital and not God's. This not only contradicts a Christian worldview, but is simply untrue. I would prefer to be taught the truth. But now, I'm a not, but now I am not allowed to enter my school building. My fellow classmates and I firmly understand that study is worship. Because of the health department, I have been locked not only out of my school, but also my place of worship. As a student that is directly affected by the forced closing of my school last week, I would ask that the commissioners hold the health department accountable for those actions. In closing, I would like to present the true story in which we filter everything we learn and study. We know that God created this world and that he gave us 10 rules, the 10 commandments that he asked us to keep. We know that we broke those rules and therefore we are guilty before a righteous judge. Because of this and God wanting to be in a relationship with us, he sent his only son, Jesus Christ, to die for us. And Jesus died paying our price and rose again, defeating death. Because of this, we can enter into a restored relationship with Jesus and God. Because if we, because if we, sorry, if we accept the gift of Jesus' sacrifice on our behalf, I appreciate your time. Thank you for letting me speak. Young lady, you did a great job with that speech. Great eye contact. Who's next? Next, we have Andy Van Sluten.
Good afternoon. My name is Andy Van Sloten. I'm employed as a plumber and a fluid power technician, and I reside in West Olive in District 9 under Commissioner Philip Kuiper Kyers. The reason I have chosen to speak to you today is because I am a parent of a child at Libertas Christian Schools. My hope for you, my hope is for you to hear my voice today as you are the only recourse we the people have to voice our displeasure and concern with the actions of the Ottawa County Health Department, especially since we do not elect or appoint health, office, health officers or the county administrator. On Thursday, October 22nd, a judge determined both sides remain in present standing until a determination the following week. However, under the cover of darkness, <coughs> after 9 p.m., the Ottawa County Health Department illegally and unconstitutionally closed our school which had zero active COVID cases. These actions leave no doubt in my mind that these orders were carried out as a retaliation to the lawsuit Libertas has filed against state officials, the Michigan Health Department and the Ottawa County Health Department. My questions to you are this, would the health department quarantine a building with no active COVID cases if there wasn't an active lawsuit? How do employees at the health department decide what buildings to quarantine? We fully understand the issue at hand is in litigation, as many of you have pointed out, but that does not excuse your duty to your constituents to rein in the gross abuse of power from the Ottawa County Health Department. I pray that this board would have the courage to exercise the authority and oversight over the county, county administrator and the Ottawa County Health Department, for which we the people have elected you to do. Thank you for your time. Andy, who's next? Mr. Chair, we do have four comments that are coming in online over Zoom. Did we, was there anyone out, out in the lobby? Not at this. Okay. Time. There are some people out now. You can certainly. I think the idea at some point was to change the room and get new people in that right. needed to want to talk. No, not of them. I want to speak. Nope. Okay. okay. All right. Let's okay. Take so the first comment is from Kristen Megan, and your name and your address. Hi. So hi. I am uh, trying to uh, reconnect. My headset standby. Is my audio okay? It's just coming through here. Yeah. Is my we're having the same audio issues we had last time. Is my audio okay? Can you hear my audio? I, yes. Yeah, go yes. ahead. Yeah. Okay. Okay, well, hi, my name is Kristen Megan Kelly. I reside at 4522 Equestrian Drive in Hudsonville. I've lived in Ottawa County for just over five years. I am currently traveling or I would be there in person. What I would like you to understand is I normally have a very, a very long list of scientific evidence against the mask mandates. What I want you to know is that I spent nine years on active duty working in bioenvironmental engineering. I've spent the past 18 years working in the field of occupational and environmental toxicology as a senior industrial hygienist. I am the person who, if you ask any doctor, any nurse, I am the person who selects conducts risk assessment. I pick PPE out. I train people on PPE. I've tested over 10,000 masks. I've managed OSHA's respiratory protection program for over 76,000 people in eight different states and two countries. What appalls me as a veteran is that I know there is a female in that room from the health department who does not hold a degree in industrial hygiene in the eye of the law under OSHA credentials. The only professionals credentialed to make decisions on whether or not PPE is going to work for a specific hazard is a industrial hygienist. Can you even imagine what it's like to be in this career field for almost 20 years with the oath and ethics to take care of all employees and individuals and to sit by and watch a group of people with no credentials and understanding that cloth masks, e-loop masks, surgical masks, these masks are not rated whatsoever to protect against a virus. I have studies from 2009, from 2013, 2014, 2015, when the H1N1 outbreak occurred, testing the facts that not only do these masks not work, this is what I need you to hear. This is where my frustration lies. These masks are increasing the spread. It occurs through self-contamination and cross-contamination. And to give you a visualization, 
count how many times you and everyone else around you pulls on your mask. You don't wash your hands when you do that. If you did that in the work setting, that's an OSHA recordable. I could write up my employees. I could write up a doctor. Anyone who touches their mask while they're wearing it is considered cross-contamination. And studies in, amongst healthcare workers, an RCT study, showed the reason that in, uh, healthcare workers continue to um, push and transmit the flu amongst each other was because they were not utilizing universal precautions and they weren't wearing the right PPE. I've sat in infectious disease, disease boards and do you know what we put people in? Powered air purifying respirators. So for the, for the county health department to shut down a private school that has no outbreaks except two people having a virus with a 99% recovery rate. If you don't see how this is unconstitutional, illegal, and unethical, and again, at the hands of Lisa, who has no industrial hygiene degree, she should be facing criminal charges, and that's all I have to say. Thank you, Kristen. Next, we have Lene. And Lene, again, if I could just uh, get your first and last name and your address for the record. Sure, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. All righty, Lene Monera, address 6722 Pierce Street in Allendale. Um, I've lived the majority of my life in Ottawa County. The older I get, the more I realize that Ottawa County has been so successful because of its values. Living in Ottawa County my entire life, it values God. It values family. Ottawa County values hard work, personal responsibility, and independence. These values are near and dear to my heart. They may sound like just vague concepts, but they're very real for most of us. Those values are reflected in our institutions of church and private Christian schools. Those institutions truly are under attack. It sounds like a cliche, but they are under attack and the attack has come to Ottawa County. Nothing reflects the attack more than the Ottawa County Health Department's shutting down of Libertas in the tiny town of Beaver Dam. I have a copy of the complaint that was filed by Libertas in federal district court. I understand because I'm in the legal field. I understand that a complaint contains claims and allegations, but I know the complaint was signed by Bob Davis that tells me all I need to know about the truth of the allegations in the complaint. That complaint highlights that the health department is attacking Libertas because it still holds chapel and morning worship assembly. Chapel is an exercise of one's religion. We have the constitutional right to exercise our religious freedom in America. If the health department is allowed to post signs on the door of Libertas, saying building closure due to COVID. What happens on Sunday morning when a lot of us wanna to go to church and they, we show up? Are we gonna see the same signs under the same pretext? The health department also criticizes Libertas because it's left it up to the parents to decide whether their kids wear masks. That's a parental right guaranteed to us parents by the Michigan State Constitution which reads, quote, it is a natural fundamental right of parents to determine and direct the care, teaching and education of their children, end of quote. There is nothing in our US or state constitution that says these rights are suspended in the times of crisis or a pandemic. In fact, it is precisely in times of crisis that our rights need to be protected the most because fear breeds control. Our society has bred so much fear that we are being tricked into believing that we need to give up our constitutional rights for the greater good. And if you're not willing to give up those constitutional rights to protect others, you are deemed selfish. Commissioners, please do not allow the health department to destroy our religious freedom Please do not allow the health department to destroy our parental rights under Lene, the guise um, your of three keeping us is safe. Up. Thank, Thank you, Lene. Thanks Thank so much. You. Our next comment is from a user with an username DNS. And again, if you could state your full name and address for the record. 
Islands 269, Wild Duck Lane in Allendale. Um, I have a different topic. Could you repeat that, please? My name is Dawn Southwick, and I live at 11269 Wild Duck Lane. Could you hear that? Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Um, I have a different topic, actually, that I would like to discuss or request of the um, board. I live in Allendale Township, and Ottawa County encompasses that township. Um, I believe Ottawa County had created a diversity and inclusion department about maybe four years ago-ish. And I would like to request for that department to lend its hand here in Allendale Township. We have a couple um, major topics that have been fallen on deaf ears with our own board. We have had global news coverage here and we've had militia men in our park that we do not use anymore for children, at least some of us. So if at any time you could utilize or let us utilize the diversity department, which I would assume was created for the surrounding areas, not just like inside the county building, but we need this diversity and inclusion department to reach out into the broader community that Ottawa County covers and to do some good for our local community. And I actually agree with what the Ottawa County, County Department did with closing the school if they were not worried about the whole department or the whole community in general. There's lots of ways to teach our kids than one. I just had to throw that in there since I had to listen to everybody else. Thank you for your time board. I appreciate it. Thank you, Don. Thank you. The next comment we have is from Sandy Betton. And Sandy, if you could state your address for the record. Maybe I could, sorry. There we go. You there, Sandy? Thanks. Yeah, I'm here. Hi, Betton, uh, 2805 Judson Road, Spring Lake. Hi, guys. Um, Ottawa County Commissioners are in charge of Ottawa County Health Department. The Ottawa County Health Department has been sued twice in the last week for tyrannical overreach. I'm wondering if we'll be paying the legal fees to defend these actions. Many of us taxpayers do not support such abuse of power by unelected bureaucrats. Should we continue to employ the health department director under whose watch this is happening? They report to the commissioners. Should we continue to employ you, the commissioners, under whose watch this is also happening? This past week, Michigan State Board uh, school member, Tom McMillan, noted the following about Libertas on Facebook. 10 of the 11 Ottawa County Commissioners are Republican. What are they doing immediately to stop this outrage? All the countywide elected officials are also Republicans. Any of them not stepping up to fight this need to be removed quickly from office. They control this insane county health department." Unquote. Prior related actions of the health department include excluding from school any healthy children unvaccinated for chickenpox for up to 21 days when there's a chickenpox case in school. The CPVAX is created with aborted fetal cells. Some parents decline it. It's used for religious reasons and the exclusion of healthy children from school for a case of chickenpox in the school is religious discrimination, which we're hearing about with Libertas today. Will they similarly exclude children in the future who are not vaccinated for another virus that may also use unethical or immoral ingredients? The only reason I bring this up is because Ottawa County does not have a historically parental rights friendly health department. With this history, is it likely the health department is just looking out for Libertas in the community or are they actually trying to um, exercise force simply to intimidate for another purpose? As a parent of a daughter who attends Hillsdale College, I have a good understanding about limited government. I continue to be disappointed that our Republican elected officials refuse to stand for scientific truth, moral and ethical truth and limited government. We are not yet a socialist nation and need to work to restrict overreach by these bureaucratic agencies, not promote it. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. Who do we have next? So far we have two more commenters. The next one is Janine. And Janine, if we could get you to state your name and address for the record. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, my name is Janine Gasper. I'm a resident of Allendale. My address is 12312 White Pine Drive. 
Um, I am a seven year resident of Ottawa County in the eighth district, living specifically in Allendale. Mr. DeYoung, thank you for your service to our district. Thank you also to the rest of you for taking the time to listen to the public today. Allendale and in particular, Ryan Kelly, sorry. Allendale and in particular, Ryan Kelly have put Ottawa County in the public eye for all the wrong reasons. I would appreciate if as a group, the Ottawa County commissioners having more integrity than the Allendale Township Board would publicly denounce the presence of the only Confederate statue in our state, along with request the removal of the appointed planning commissioner, Ryan Kelly from the planning commission board. For the past six months, I have been calling into that Allendale Township Board meetings requesting these two things. The Township Board has done a whole lot of nothing in response. Last night I told the Township Board about the evening I described the statue to my 16 year old son who said he would have to see the statue to form an opinion. Upon viewing a, a photo of the statue, he exclaimed, wow, that is worse than your description. Why is it that my 16 year old white son whose interests vary from gaming to welding and blacksmithing can look at a photo of the Confederate statue in our town and immediately see the obvious problems with it? But our township board doesn't have that same ability. It's embarrassing that we are now des designated the Confederate capital of Michigan. Having only been a resident of Ottawa County for a single year, Ryan Kelly has instigated peaceful protesters and invited domestic terrorists to our park. His Facebook pages and websites have been removed more than one time. While Facebook has attempted to mute his all right dangerous messages, our township board stands Stance has stood by his right to assemble in our park with armed militia sharing dangerous messages, including free the nulls, and to not wear masks for the safety of our community members because they infringe on our rights. This past Saturday, national and international news channels were present at the park to report on the presence of not one, but two armed groups. While I completely understand the presence of a security line for the group requesting the removal of the statue and the removal of Ryan Kelly, I am not in favor of any massive group of armed people in or around our parks where children play. I feel like we are standing by watching a powder keg about to explode. Our own park rules state that no person shall with the intent to annoy or insult another or in a manner likely to annoy or insult another do any of the following acts. Use obscene language or make an obscene gesture or direct indecent abusive or threatening language to any other person or persons when such words tend to inflict injury or incite a breach of the peace. Please call on Adam Ellenboss to do his job and hold our public officials to a higher standard. Thank you. Thanks, Janine. And the next comment we have is from Justine. And Justine, if you could state your full name and address for the record. Can you hear us? Justine, are you there? Okay, Audio so there. Um, is there anyone in the hallway? No, there isn't anyone out there that wishes to speak. Okay, all right. So Justin? And we certainly do have a second opportunity for public comment as well, if we can. All right, all right. So we're gonna close the public hearing, public comments, um, part of the agenda and go on to communication from county staff. And we are not doing um, A, but we are doing B, public health update from Lisa Stefanowski. <coughs> Lisa, please. Uh, uh, and can you hear us? Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you. Um, I just want to start uh, by introducing Gerald Glasshauer. He is our senior epi and has spoken before the board previously. Um, I'd be asking him to come to the meeting today to present um, our most recent data picture related to COVID-19. So I'm going to turn it over to him. Good afternoon, commissioners. Um, it's a pleasure being with you here today. I'm going to um, share my screen here. I have a couple of slides with information. Darrell, um, could you speak uh, closer to your microphone, please? You bet. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yep, that's better. Um, commissioners, is there anyone on your end that can um, give me the ability to share my screen? John? All right, let me. 
Speak to my Justin. Oh, you can go for it, John. Sorry. I thought I thought they had it. We're working at it, Darrell. Do it now. Darrell, can you do it now? I can do it now. Thank you. Okay, if you guys will just confirm that you can see the um, PowerPoint slides in front of you. I'm going to do my best to make sure I know which screen I'm on. One second. Place where I can find my cursor here. All right, I'm sorry for the delay. Um, thank you, everyone. So my name is Darrell Glasshauer. I'm the senior epidemiologist here with Ottawa County. Um, I'm going to share today just a couple of slides about the status of um, COVID-19 in Ottawa County. Um, I shared a presentation uh, recently also with the board just around um, the trends in Ottawa County. So you're going to see some slides that are similar to my past presentation with some updated information. The first slide here that I want to show just depicts basically the three waves of COVID-19 that we've seen. The first wave was characterized by uh, cases in long-term care facilities and food processing and food manufacturing, followed by um, more cases among teens and younger people in their 20s, and then followed up again by an outbreak at Grand Valley State University, which contributed um, hundreds of cases. And then lastly, we have this um, third wave here, a run-up of cases that does not have a predominant epidemiological theme. Uh, what we see there is uh, community spread across most age groups and demographics. And that hasn't changed since I last reported out to the commissioners. And so I also want to display this same curve uh, with Grand Valley cases depicted on it. So you can see that as Grand Valley cases have gone down, they've also remained low and that the majority of cases that are coming in are not affiliated with Grand Valley, uh, indicating wider community spread. I also want to show a breakdown of the age groups uh, that are affected by COVID-19, particularly here in October. Uh, this is a chart showing different bars that indicate the different age decades of cases uh, in October here in Ottawa County, just to get an idea of the recent trend. The gray bars indicate the proportion of that age group in our county. So for um, cases and of our population ages zero to nine, they make up about 13.3% of our population, but in October only made up 3.7% of our cases. So I just wanna point out that these two age demographics, zero to nine and 10 to 19, um, we're not seeing proportionally as many cases uh, as we would expect in these age groups based on the population that they make up in our county. And so this suggests since zero to nine and 10 to 19 are the um, school ages, it suggests that schools are not currently super spreading settings. Um, and one of the, the highlights that I wanted to make is, is just the partnership that the Ottawa County Department of Public Health has um, with most of the schools in our county and that we have a close relationship with them and a team here at the health department that works with uh, liaisons at the different uh, schools, just working through contact tracing. Our schools have also done a fantastic job with um, mitigation strategies like masking and distancing and regular cleaning and hand hygiene. So um, what I can say is that these case counts proportionally remain low. Um, my hope is that that continues and it is probably supported and helped by the efforts of our local schools. So I just want to uh, recognize the tremendous effort of uh, the academic institutions in our community to help prevent the spread of COVID-19. We dive into the data a little bit further. Uh, this is just a graph that shows cases that are affiliated with schools and those that are not. So this is not just students. It also includes any staff members that we identify. I know it's a little bit hard to see, but basically the light blue line are non-affiliated cases. You can see that there's this dramatic uptrend, especially in recent weeks. And in the dark blue are the school affiliated cases. And there are definitely cases, but they are not rising as precipitously as the community wide cases. And so this is just a, a little bit more evidence suggesting that uh, cases are not spreading um, in a super spreading fashion in our schools. I want to zoom back out to Ottawa County as a whole. Um, if you haven't seen the Michigan Safe Start map, please check it out. There's a lot of really important information on there. 
And I just wanted to point out that overall Ottawa County's um, case rate has um, breached an upper threshold that we have. It's depicted here in this dark purple line. And basically what it shows is that we've been above that level for a number of days now. Uh, this level is the highest risk level for case rates and Ottawa County is not alone. Uh, as we zoom out even further to the Grand Rapids region, which includes a number of counties uh, in, in West Michigan, um, we can see that the case rate has also breached that 150 cases per day per million. And it looks like it's going to be sustained. I don't have any evidence that those numbers are going to be coming down, um, but I'm confident that with uh, the community working together, that we can blunt the impact of COVID-19. Finally, I just want to re reiterate a couple of messages. And one is that we're continuing to see community spread. Our previous highs are our current lows. Uh, and uh, that's something that we want to fix. We want to bring those case counts down. And we can all work together to prevent COVID-19 by masking, socially distancing, and encouraging hand hygiene. And lastly, our personal decisions impact our community. Um, if we choose not to take precautions, case counts will go up. And that can have a dramatic impact on local academia, courts, businesses, and long-term care facilities. And I just want to point out too that over the next couple of months, there's a lot of events that are happening that are traditionally social, like Halloween and Thanksgiving and Christmas, and just want to uh, caution everyone to uh, take measures to prevent the spread of COVID-19 uh, during these traditionally more social times. And that's it for me, commissioners. Thank you. Darrell, can you hold on just a minute? I want to see if there's any questions for you. Chris. You bet. Yeah, hey, Darrell, can we go back about five slides with the um, school population? Uh, right there, yeah. Uh, one more. You bet. That one right there, yep. Yeah, I wonder if you can kind of talk about, you know, we had the GPSU situation and, you know, we're looking at schools um, maybe not being um, as a big a threat as we had thought, but yet we're still getting wide community spread. Is, how do you see that? Um, I mean, if you look at the graph, you say, oh, kids are going back to school and, and my, school, my son went to school uh, for the first time last week. And you would think, oh, that's the reason, but that doesn't look necessarily to be the reason. Could you kind of talk about that a little bit? I mean, you see 20 to 29 is above expectations, right? Uh, 30 or 39 is above expectations. Yeah, I, I want to make sure I understand your question. I can make a, a little bit of a comment that some of those case counts might be low in the 0 to 9 and 10 to 19 because of the mitigation strategies that are in place in school settings. Okay. Um, and outside of that, um, we're seeing more socialization and obviously some fatigue with a lot, some of the precautions. And that's why we just want to um, encourage everyone to continue with those, stay the course. Um, it's hard and we recognize that, um, but these measures are effective at preventing uh, of COVID-19. And you're right, we're seeing um, higher than expected proportion of our cases in those 80 groups, uh, 20 plus. And if you look at the 80 plus, you'll see that that's uh, higher than expected too. And those are the populations that we're most concerned about simply because the risk for complications and death are higher. Is that perhaps because those are, that's kind of a more working age population as they go back to work in, in bigger numbers or seeing higher than expected case counts with that population or? I think work is, is part of the picture, but there are also other opportunities, uh, you know, for people to be in contact with others. So anytime there's um, any opportunity for gathering, um, that's where we're seeing spread. So we focus a lot on, you know, making sure our environment's clean, but one of the best ways that we can prevent the spread of COVID-19 is, is social distancing. So uh, those older age groups, uh, what we're seeing is is in the evidence and the data that we have is, is definitely evidence of more gathering. So we wanna encourage people to uh, be cautious about social gatherings. Okay, great, thank you. Anyone else? Durrell, oh, go ahead. Right. Yes, Commissioner Garcia, I do have one question. On your uh, dashboard, when we look at the numbers of cases in Ottawa County, are we able to determine what percentage of those are happening, let's say at the GVSU or Hope College, where we might have students who have a tendency to go back home maybe during the uh, weekend and then come back? And if we were able to take those numbers out, you know, what kind of an increase you know, would we be looking at for Ottawa County? That's a great question, Commissioner. One of the graphs that I have here kind of depicts that is 
what happens when we take the Grand Valley cases out or when we display them. And you had a question about Hope College as well. Um, they're contributing only a, a very minor number of cases overall. Um, and so when we take those cases out, we still see a, a pretty tremendous rise in community cases as this figure um, shows. Even with the Grand Valley cases kind of taken out, the purple bars, which is everyone else, uh, are still rising precipitously. Darrell, would you comment on, uh, we've all heard, um, we've always had people talk to us about how, of course, uh, we're gonna see more cases because we're testing more. Would you uh, comment on that? Yeah, I'd be happy to. I would encourage people to take a look at our, our website. So the Ottawa County dashboard has uh, weekly numbers of tests that are conducted. Uh, and then we also have the number of cases by day. And if you look at the, the general trends, the general waves, the waxing and waning of COVID-19 in our community, um, it doesn't correlate very well with the continuous march up of uh, testing. So generally, week after week, we have more and more and more tests conducted in our community. Uh, but the number of cases that have been coming in every day uh, varies from month to month. Sometimes it's up and sometimes that's down. Uh, if there was a much tighter correlation between the number of tests that were being done and the number of cases that were coming out, uh, we wouldn't see that, um, that sort of waxing and waning in the cases. And so we also have done statistics behind the scene looking for correlation between the number of tests that are being done and the number of cases that are coming in. And we don't see a very strong correlation between the two. It doesn't mean that more testing um, is gonna find more cases but it doesn't explain the whole picture. Thank you, Darrell. Any other questions? If not, we'll move back to Lisa. Yes. Thank you. Um, I do want to mention just a couple other things that are, are really important. Um, as you know, we monitor our long-term care facilities very closely, and we are seeing an increase in cases. We are seeing out of our 17 um, long-term care facilities in Ottawa County. We've got several outbreaks going on right now. Um, you know, there's a lot of, of discussion about the authority of the health officer, the authority of the state health officer or the state health director. And um, we are um, given authority to exercise the provisions in the Michigan Public Health Code when we feel that there is an Im imminent health threat or any kind of danger to our population. And we know that COVID can be very serious for many people, um, but I want everybody to know that we take that authority um, to exercise orders very, very seriously. And um, in my 30 years of public health experience, I've very, very, very rarely had to issue public health orders, um, cease and desist orders, um, you know, orders against gathering, any of these kinds of orders. And it's because largely people are very cooperative um, we can say, hey, we got a complaint or um, we've noticed that we have a trend here and people adapt to um, doing the uh, behaviors that will prevent any kind of outbreak. Um, this past week, we've been talking a lot with our school superintendents and other school uh, building staff, as well as parents. Um, we've talked with health officers from the surrounding counties. Those are people that are in the same position that I am only overseeing um, counties in our area. Um, we all agree as a group of health officers that we want to do whatever it takes to, to keep schools open. Um, we also um, see that, um, you know, a school is a place where a lot more than learning takes place. Um, and we believe that, that that is critically important to the welfare of children. And so um, we will not be quick to close schools. Um, we have a lot of variables to consider. Um, fortunately, so many of our schools have been very open with us and sharing data, um, sharing information, working very closely with us. Um, we've established good relationships and I know that we will continue to do that and we will make those decisions together. Um, there was a recent letter that came out from the ISDs from Kent, Muskegon and Ottawa all indicating that all schools should be prepared 
for school closures. Um, but I just want to be clear that has not been um, the position that we're taking right now. And we all need to be prepared because our cases are going up and we just don't know where they will go. Um, but my best advice, my best public health advice is, um, you know, we should really follow the layered approach to mitigation strategies because one approach by itself isn't going to um, be the most effective. So the layered approach, again, um, wash hands, use hand sanitizer, wear a face covering, um, uh, social distance, and don't get together in large groups of people. Um, as Darrell mentioned, so many of our outbreaks and so much transmission takes place when people get together in groups and are not distancing and not masking. <clears throat> so on that note, I'll just open it up to any questions. You have a question? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Lisa, uh, I wonder if, uh, you could help me understand um, the center of disease control. Do they consider an outbreak anything one or two or three? What is what is considered an outbreak? Yeah, I need, need with to defer to Drell control and control oh, or with, with your health department if there's a difference. No, there's no difference. The um, Centers for Disease Control, as well as the um, organization that oversees epidemiologists, they have very defined definitions of what an outbreak is. And in some cases, it's based on um, the specific disease. And Darrell, do you wanna just, okay. Well, thank you. Um, as Lisa mentioned, the CDC does have a formal definition for an outbreak. Oh, in an closer outbreak. to the microphone, Darrell. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the CDC does have a formal definition for a COVID-19 outbreak. It's based on guidance that's offered by the Council for State and Territorial Epidemiologists. So this is a, a national organization here in the United States that um, puts together a lot of the definitions for the diseases that we track and also thresholds for when we define an outbreak. And they have a number of documents that are published online for different settings where outbreaks occur. Uh, educational settings like schools is definitely one of them. And you can um, view those online, MDHHS's uh, school outbreak website. The list that's published has a link to that um, document as well. And the definition um, generally is two or more cases in an educational setting um, qualifies as a COVID-19 outbreak. Thank you. Thanks, Darrell. <clears throat> Anyone else? Frank? Yes, I do have a question for Lisa. Uh, Lisa, am I correct in assuming that the health department would be visiting a, uh, whether it's a school or a business or any site because there were concerns expressed from within the organization, whether it's a staff member or a parent or a resident? Hmm. Um, that's an excellent question. So from the very beginning of the pandemic, um, we take our customer comments and um, comments from any resident in Ottawa County very seriously. We listen to people, we hear people, I mean, we try to respond to their concerns. So whenever we received a, a complaint regarding COVID, um, whether it's a school or a business or, or anything, um, we reach out to the organization and we make them aware that, they, that we have received a complaint. And at that point, um, generally what we have done is we provided them with the guidance that um, the state has provided for us on whatever the order um, is that maybe has been violated. Um, we offer them the opportunity to ask any questions. And I would say 99% of the time, people then become compliant um, with, within the, the construct of those orders. Um, if we get more than one complaint, um, we reach out again and we use the educational approach. Um, we've had some organizations that, you know, depending on the situation and depending on the, the employees and, you know, maybe sometimes there have been um, cultural or uh, language barriers. We, we take all of those things into consideration. We really take a, a, an educational approach and a partner approach um, with every action that we take from the health department. Um, we only, 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 ever use enforcement as a last resort when we have not been able to um, get compliance um, using our other uh, more educational approach. Thank you. Anyone else? Greg? Greg? Yeah, Lisa, um, can you explain to us a little bit, you know, you, a lot of statistics are going out there today 
Um, when do people start dropping off the list? Okay, what has to happen for people so that, to drop off the list? Okay, I mean, you, you test positive, you go into quarantine, you get, a, you get a letter after two weeks that you're free for normal activity. How long do you stay on that list after that? Um, it, it, Commissioner DeYoung, I'm not sure if I understand what list. Um, if you're talking about the, case, the list or the, the statistic about how many cases we've had, we do track cases from the very beginning um, since our very first case, so it's cumulative data. Um, any other list? Andrell, can you think of that we're keeping on? I mean, once you, if you are a case, you will be in our queue to receive daily monitoring text messages until the time when you're released from isolation, which would be um, 10 days, um, improving symptoms and um, no fever. Okay. If you're in quarantine, well, then, which means you're a, a contact, um, you don't remain on any list um, once you've um, been released from quarantine, which is generally 14 days, unless all you have people, all those folks out there that are getting text messages. Oh, okay. Every day, uh, those people after a period of time, are they still as part of the COVID numbers that are coming through? They would be, if they were a case, they would be in the total number of cases that we've had, but they wouldn't be, they shouldn't be continuing to be monitored or anything like that. They just drop out, okay. if, I'm, if I'm understanding correctly. Okay, thank you. Uh, Lisa, um, question for you regarding um, case count. Um, give you an example, say I test positive and I've in the last 24 hours have been in close contact with 30 people. None of those people have been tested, but do the numbers go by me and the close contacts or is it just purely the positive results? Um, I mean, our, like yesterday, I think, you know, there was 161 or 141 new cases. Are those all positives or are those positives and close contacts? Those are only reflecting a new positive case. And so I, I know it's hard to believe that we're having that many cases. It, um, it is a real significant increase in the number of cases. We have a completely different statistic that monitors how many close contacts that we are monitoring at any given time. And we also keep statistics on um, the average number of contacts or close contacts per case. Um, but no, they're they're very separate. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Chairman. Yep. Yes. Go ahead, Randy first Le and then Kyle. Lisa, Randy Meplink. Um, I have a school question, uh, just to follow up from what we talked about a couple of weeks ago. Um, if a student is asked to uh, stay home due to a possible um, exposure, okay, and they go into the 14-day quarantine. Um, can they go, one of the things I, I guess, I, I'm just, my question is, if they're able to get a negative test or two negative tests, do they still need to stay home because some schools are keeping their kids home even after a negative test? Or what is the stance of, or what is the requirement for returning back to school? Can they go back earlier if they have one, two, three negative tests? Oh, this is such a, an important question. I'm glad you asked it because I, um, I think there's a lot of confusion out there about this. Um, the answer is, is sometimes a point of frustration for people. So if you are a positive contact, so let's say um, my husband had COVID. So now I am a close contact. I am required to go in quarantine for 14 days. And the reason behind that is because according to the science, I could become symptomatic anywhere between day one and day 14. So let's say I got a test on day five. That only tells me my COVID status on that day. It, I could become symptomatic on day six, day eight, day 10, any day after that. So we don't allow a positive, or I mean, a, a negative test result to allow a person to get out of quarantine. 
Uh, now, do you have any a question about that? No, that kind of, I mean, it, it? Okay. it ex explains it. I mean, it other than, you know, you see in the constantly in the news media, whether it's in, in uh, uh, sports, uh, especially in sports and college sports, uh, where they can, you know, get a negative test and it can return to play within a week. Okay. I mean, if we're seeing this nationally and, and the only reason I say that is, is, you know, I mean, there's somebody told me a while back and they said, you know, uh, and I'm going to quote Ronald Reagan when they said, you know, the, the, the 11 most scariest words are, um, I work for the government and I'm here to help it, you know, and when we're hearing this, okay. And we're seeing all this different indecisive, it's just, it brings up a lot of questions and that's why, you know, really for schools, re, the most important place is to get these kids back to school. And as you agree, I know that. Uh, okay. But that's why my question was really just how they get, sorry about this mask, but I mean, how they get to that point if they're negative, but apparently that if there is a 14 yeah. day period. So. Yeah. I, 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 I can't speak to what's happening in the sports arena, um, but I can tell you that um, the, the, the protocol that we use with regard to um, when a close contact is released from quarantine is based on um, what the CDC guidance says, the World Health Organization, also our own state organization, the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. And so um, that is what we have to follow. Um, so okay. it's, it's consistently applied in Michigan. I can right. tell you. Okay. Thank you. Kyle. Hello, Lisa. <clears throat> this is Kyle. Um, I was just wondering, looking at the, the dashboard right now, 129,000 uh, people have been tested. Do we know how many people have been tested multiple times? And then if someone tests is positive for COVID and then they wait a few days or, you know, 13 days, get retested and they test positive again, is that two positive cases? I'm going to let Jarrell answer that question, if you don't mind. Thank you for the question. Uh, the question is, is generally about uh, positivity and how we calculate it. Um, if you look at our website, the calculation is based on all of the tests that are conducted, and it includes people that have uh, tested positive multiple times. Um, that was a little bit more common earlier in the outbreak. Uh, when one of the ways to get out of isolation was repeated testing. Uh, now we have a, a, a timed approach that in, includes symptom reduction in order for a person to be released from isolation. So it's less common for people to be tested multiple times. Uh, and in addition to that, we've done some analysis here at the health department looking about at, at test positivity. So including all of the positives and all of the negatives or just including a person one time if they're if they're positive, and then taking them out into the future. And what we're seeing is that the positivity metric, either person positivity or test positivity, doesn't change that much. Uh, and so we've maintained the lab test positivity um, because it's a simpler, more straightforward, and easier metric to maintain, and still reflects the situation well. Did that answer your question? Yeah, and then I got one more. What is the um, current rate of like asymptomatic? And we're talking a lot about symptoms. So if someone's asymptomatic, uh, how does that work? Are they in quarantine for four? I mean, if they show no symptoms, how, do, how, do, how is that working? So I can speak to the statistic. Um, uh, the last meeting I mentioned that our, our asymptomatic rate was probably close to 15%. The actual number is somewhere between 12 and 15%. And a lot of the folks that we detect that have a positive test or, or some of them are you know, folks that are going in for procedures like elective procedures that you need to prove with a negative COVID-19 test uh, that you're negative before having the procedure. So we do detect them uh, and they are real. And the approach that we use is similar to if someone had a positive test and symptoms. We keep them in isolation for a period of time uh, just to make sure that if they are shedding any virus and if they're contagious, um, that they're not exposing the people around them. But I'll look to my uh, peers here, both uh, Lisa and Dr. Heidel, to see if there are any nuances to the amount of time that someone is in isolation who has a positive test and is asymptomatic. Yeah. Yeah. Um 
Yeah, I, I would concur with Darrell's on um, Doc Heidel, and I agree it would, it would still be um, 10 days. You know, it, again, I think one thing that's really important to bring up with regard to asymptomatic cases, uh, there are cases that are asymptomatic. And we see kids that are asymptomatic. And even though children's cases tend to be um, less severe, and we know that and even in a reduced transmission, and they still can spread COVID to, to people that may be immune compromised. Um, so therefore it's really, really important again to um, among the entire population promote those preventative measures of masking and distancing and not gathering and, and hand washing, especially in because there are asymptomatic cases that might not know that they're spreading the virus. Okay, we've got another question from Al. Yeah, Lisa, has anybody in Ottawa County got it twice? Um, there's some evidence emerging in the, you know, the world that um, there are there have been a few confirmed cases where people have gotten COVID twice. Um, I can tell you that we had one case, and this is um, anecdotal. Um, that we thought that, that came back um, very early on in our COVID experience that was positive and recently tested positive again. Um, we don't know if that was an anomaly or if it was really truly another COVID test, but it was a curiosity um, for our team, certainly. Okay, my second question is, on the news this morning, I heard that the government issued 1.5 million instant test okay mm -hmm. and you were just talking about an elected uh, procedure like a colonoscopy you need a test four days before but mm -hmm. really <laughs> i could be negative on the first day and then three days later i could be positive and they won't know that i'm positive am i correct on that so when do we get the instant results <laughs> Um, well, first of all, um, you're absolutely correct. There are, um, are uh, the rapid tests coming out from the federal government. Um, we have been asked by our state partners at MDHHS to uh, provide them with some numbers of what we think we might need in Ottawa County, and we have, we have placed an order. And we're also working on plans uh, right now to identify how best those rapid tests would be used um, so we'll be working, obviously, with our partners within Ottawa County. We may be able to work with schools, with healthcare providers, um, and with maybe long-term care facilities to um, implement these rapid tests or provide them. And we also know that some of those rapid tests will be going directly to um, maybe long-term care facilities, maybe schools. We just don't know yet. Uh, but I will certainly keep you all posted on that. We're actually pretty excited about the opportunity to have those more accessible to us. Um, I will say, and this might be something I want to refer to um, Dr. Heidel or Jarrell, um, there are um, some differences in the effectiveness of the rapid test versus the test that you know goes to a lab and, and comes back in a couple days. Um, I think if we do a rapid test and there's a known exposure to a case, we would consider that a valid test if it comes back positive. Um, if it's, how does that work, Darrell? Yeah. So Commissioner, you asked a really great question because um, a test that's rapid is a powerful tool in the fight against COVID-19 because you can have information in minutes you know, rather than days. And so, you know, we hope that this tool becomes, you know, available, especially to environments where they need to know faster. Um, the test that's coming uh, is a pretty good test. Uh, sensitivity and specificity is pretty high. It's not as good as the one um, that they put up your nose and uh, run like a, an RNA test in a lab with. Um, and from a counting perspective here at Public Health, it also makes things a little bit more difficult because it can be done uh, in a doctor's office and theoretically could be done in a school nurse's office. And the question is, is how do you get that information to the appropriate um, health department to get that information recorded? And um, if there's a positive test, what qualifies as being recorded by the health department? And 
And so what Lisa was referring to is that we are looking for some guidance from our, our state partners, but essentially right now is if someone has a positive rapid test and they have exposure to COVID-19, like they're a close contact or um, some known exposure at school or an event, um, they're much more likely to be counted by us here in public health. Um, but with the advent of rapid testing, we'll also have to you know, continue to adapt with the way that we count cases. Thank you. Okay. Kyle? Yeah, yeah. Lisa, just to follow up on our phone conversation this morning, um, the, the question about the mask and the, the testing, when the, uh, can you elaborate on that? And do you have any numbers on that? Or is that something that's unknown as of right now? Um, the, uh, was that the question about, do we ask questions to our contacts about whether or not they wear a mask? Correct. Yeah. If someone's tested positive, is there any Correct. questions that are they wearing a mask or they don't wear a mask or? So um, I appreciated that question too. So when we do an investigation, and, and this is actually one of the reasons why it's so important for us to do an investigation. When there is a case, we call, um, we talk to the person who has had a positive COVID test. We ask them how they're doing. We ask them if they have any questions, if they need any additional support, maybe um, a referral to another organization that may be able to help them if they've got a difficult life situation on top of COVID. Um, so part of our investigation includes asking them um, if in the past, you know, period of time leading up to their COVID positive, they were wearing masks, if they were um, social distancing. Um, we do <coughs> use that information to help us discern um, how to handle close contacts. Um, so for example, if a person works in a business, say, and they worked with five people in the business and they were wearing a mask and they were social distancing at all times, um, that would tell us that the people in the business wouldn't need to be um, put in quarantine. And if they weren't masking and distancing, we would put them in quarantine. So it, it provides us with really important information that helps us to help not only the business who needs to have employees, uh, but also, you know, those individuals who, um, you know, have made a good decision to do those things, they, you know, can continue working. So do you have, do, is there any numbers like uh, a percentage of positive tests that were strongly wearing masks or a percentage of moderate usage or anything like that? Or Yeah. Um, I, I don't believe we have uh, analyze the data back. in that way at this time. We've really only used it thus far uh, to to help us determine isolation and quarantine. Go ahead, Frank. Uh, Lisa, uh, it's more of a comment. As a former committal school principal who was responsible for over 600 students, high school principal with 1,500 students, and a school superintendent with over 500 students, uh, I know how how your role is. It's a difficult time. You have to make some difficult decisions. And I applaud all of your efforts, uh, you know, whether people agree with them or don't agree with them. There were many days when I got phone calls and, and, and emails from parents who didn't agree with my decision. But I know that you and your whole department are in a difficult position, just like the whole country is. So I, uh, so I thank you for your efforts and your team as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Frank. Yes, Chairman. Uh, Lisa, one, one more thing, if I may, and I'm looking for some encouragement from you today. For I mean, for for this board, encouragement for for everybody that's here. You know, we've we've been working real hard since you know mid February, March, and and you know we were asked to stay home when things will get better, and our businesses got shut down because that will get things better, and our churches were taken away from us because things were going to get better after that, and. And now we have to wear masks for almost every reason except for taking a shower and things are going to get better. Can you leave us with some hope, some encouragement today? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, what's the future, the next 90 days, the next half a year is going to look like if we continue to follow these guidelines, social distance, wear a mask? I, I was looking for some encouragement. Uh, well, um, you know, I, I, I feel like I'm a little bit of a broken record, um, but... You know, I, I just want to say one, a couple of things. So I am a person who was, I had lived in West Michigan my whole life. 
Um, I share the same values. Um, I have a much the same moral compass as um, everyone in my community does. Um, I believe in many of the same things. Um, I'm a mom, I'm a wife, I'm a, you know, a, a child of elderly parents. I, I share many of the same experiences as the people that I serve in my community. Um, I take my job very seriously. I'm not I'm doing anything but trying to um, be a good public servant and protect all the people in my community. Um, someone pointed out on the call or a, a public comment that, you know, I, I didn't carry a specific title which disqualified me from um, being able to make decisions. And I just want to let all of you know that um, I would never make a decision without consulting with people who do carry the correct credential to make recommendations to me so that I can look at those objectively. Um, and I, I really try with all my heart to do the right thing always. Um, so having said that, I would love to give all of you hope. And I think the hope really comes in um, following masking, distancing, hand washing, and not getting in groups. Uh, that's gonna be hard with the holidays coming up. But I really feel that if we live safely, we follow these just basic principles, um, we can still do the things that we love to do. We can still um, you know, be people, we can still um, go to work, we can shop for food, we can exercise, we can go to church, uh, we can go to school. Um, I think it's just so important though that we all come together and work really hard to put um, uh, some of the animosity aside and just follow some basic principles for disease prevention. Um, and and we've, we've, we've done it so many times before. I know we can do it again. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa and Durrell. And uh, thank you for your service. And uh, we really do appreciate what you're doing. So thank you. Thank you all. With that, um, we'll just uh, hold off just a minute while some folks want to leave. Spotlight. All right. With that, I'll entertain a motion to approve the agenda, please. So moved. Support. Moved and supported. Comments or questions? Justin, would you call the roll, please? Yes, sir. Mr. Kyers. Yes. Mr. Bauman. Yes. Mr. Zylstra. Yes. Mr. Dannenberg. Yes. Mr. Meppelink. Yes. Mr. Terpstra. Yes. Mr. Holtbloor. Yes. Mr. Young. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Fenske. Yes. And Mr. Bergman. Yes. And passes. All right. Consent resolutions, Mr. Fenske, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to make a motion to approve consent resolutions one through three. Is there a second? Second. Okay. The move is seconded. Comments or questions? Would you call the roll, please? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Mr. Bauman. Yes. <laughs> Mr. Kyers. Yes. Yes. Mr. Terpstra. Yes. Mr. Mempelink. Yes. Mr. Holtbloor. Yes. Mr. DeYoung. Yes. Mr. Zylstra. Yes. Mr. Fenske. Yes. And Mr. Bergman. Yes. And passes. Action items for planning and policy, Mr. DeYoung, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Regarding the item of Explorers Trail, um, today's motion is to approve and authorize the board chairperson and clerk register to sign the easement and construction <clears throat> agreement with, Lin with Linda Mina for the item of Explorers Trail route along the south shoreline of the Grand River at a purchase price of 95,000. Support. So moved and supported. Comments or questions? Justin, would you call the roll please? Sure, Mr. DeYoung. Yes. Mr. Meppling. Yes. Mr. Zylstra. Yes. Mr. Dannenberg. Yes. Mr. Bauman. Yes. Mr. Terpstra. Yes. Mr. Holtlor. Yes. Mr. Garcia. Yes. Mr. Kyers. Yes. Mr. Fenske. Yes. 
And Mr. Bergman. Yes. Motion passes. Next. The purchase, the purchase of development rights program scoring criteria. The motion is to approve the purchase of development rights program scoring criteria for ranking applications to the 2021 purchase of development rights program. Support. Support. Moved and supported. Comments or questions? Mr. Roebuck, please. Mr. Fenske. Yes. Mr. Terpstra. Yes. Mr. Bauman. Yes. Mr. Zylstra. Yes. Mr. Dannenberg. Yes. Mr. Meplink. Yes. Mr. Garcia. Yes. Mr. Holtbloor. Yes. Mr. DeYoung. Yes. Mr. Kyers. Yes. And Mr. Bergman. Yes. Motion passes. And the final motion is a resolution to repeal the 1998 ordinance establishing the County Planning Commission. Motion is to um, to to repeal the ordinance creating the Ottawa County Planning Commission and transfer its advisory duties to the Ottawa County Board of Commissioners and the Planning and Performance Department. Second. Moved and seconded. Comments or questions? <laughs> Mr. Roebuck? Mr. Zastra. Yes. Mr. DeYoung? Yes. Mr. Garcia? Yes. Mr. Dannenberg? Yes. Mr. Meplink? Yes. Mr. Terpstra? Yes. Mr. Fenske? Yes. Mr. Bauman? Yes. Mr. Kyers. Yes. Mr. Hoogler. Yes. And Mr. Bergman. Yes. Motion passes. From Finance and Administration, Mr. Bauman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, regarding the interlocal agreement for Ottawa County to approve the designated assessor, uh, make a motion to approve and authorize the board chairperson and clerk register to sign the interlocal agreement for Ottawa County to approve the designated assessor for the period of January 1, 2021 through December 31 of 2026. Second. We're moved and supported. Comments or questions? Mr. Roebuck? Mr. Kyers? Yes. Mr. Bauman? Yes. Mr. Zylstrom? <clears throat> yes. Mr. Dannenberg? Yes. Mr. Meplink? Yes. Mr. Terpstra? Yes. Mr. Holtbler? Yes. Mr. DeYoung? Yes. Mr. Garcia? Yes. Mr. Fenske? Yes. Mr. Bergman? Yes. Motion passes. Regarding the non-benefited part-time background investigators, I make a motion to approve the creation of a pool of background investigators, non-benefit part-time to conduct background investigations for the Sheriff's Office. Support. Support. I moved and supported. Comments or questions? Mr. Roebuck? Mr. Garcia? Yes. Mr. Bauman? Yes. Mr. Kyers? Yes. Mr. Dannenberg? Yes. Mr. Terpstra? Yes. Mr. Meplink? Yes. Mr. Holtvloer? Yes. Mr. DeYoung? Yes. Mr. Zylstra? Yes. Mr. Fenske? Yes. And Mr. Bergman? Yes. You know, that would have been a pretty nice deal where my kids, my daughter's dating. I could have used this. That's <laughs> 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 pretty <Yeah. laughs> Oh, you got to pay for that. <laughs> The family courthouse project financing I make a motion to approve and authorize the board chairperson and clerk register to sign the resolution declaring official intent to reimburse family courthouse project expenditures with bond proceeds. Supported. Comments or questions? Mr. Roebuck? Mr. Kyers? Yes. Mr. Bauman? Yes. Mr. Zylstra? Yes. Mr. Dannenberg? Yes. Mr. Meplink? Yes. Mr. Terpstra? Yes. Mr. Holtbloor? Yes. Mr. DeYoung? Yes. Mr. Garcia? Yes. Mr. Fenske? Yes. Mr. Bergman? Yes. Motion passes. Regarding the 2020 Ottawa County Apportionment Report, I make a motion to approve the 2020 Ottawa County Apportionment Report. Support. Moved and supported. Comments or questions? Mr. Robot? Sir, Mr. Kyers? Yes. Mr. Bauman? Yes. Mr. Zylstra? Yes. Mr. Dannenberg? Yes. Mr. Meplink? Yes. Mr. Terpstra? Yes. Mr. Holtbloor? Yes. Mr. Fenske? Yes. Mr. DeYoung? Yes. Mr. Garcia? Yes. And Mr. Bergman? Yes. Regarding the 2019 administrative and IT cost allocation plans, I make a motion to approve the 2019 cost allocation plan and the 2019 innovation and technology department allocation plan for implementation in the 2021 budget. Support. And moved and supported. Comments or questions? Mr. Roebuck? Mr. DeYoung? Yes. Mr. Meplink? Yes. 
Mr. Zylstra. Yes. Mr. Dannenberg. Yes. Mr. Fenske. Yes. Mr. Bauman. Yes. Mr. Terpstra. Yes. Mr. Holklor. Yes. Mr. Garcia. Yes. Mr. Kyers. Yes. And Mr. Berkman. Yes. Motion passes. And finally, regarding the Hudsonville HVAC and roof replacement project, I make a motion to approve and authorize the board chairperson and clerk register to sign the low bid from cross construction in the amount of $1,697,777 to replace the HVAC equipment and replace the roof at the Hudsonville District Court. Support. Second. Been moved and seconded. Comments or questions? Mr. Rowland? I just wanted to make sure that that wasn't an additional one on there. Is that the accurate? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> the whole roof and the uh, and the uh, H V A C, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. It's replacement of roof as well. Yes. Did 22 we units are coming off, and I think that with all the holes that's going to create, it made a lot of sense to replace yep. the roof now instead of doing a whole bunch of patchwork that would be expensive and then needing to replace the whole roof on the normal schedule anyway. So this kind of gives the whole roof a fresh start with the new air conditioning uh, HVAC system on it. Did we get more than one bid? We got four, yes. four or five bids? Yeah. Okay. Yep, and that was the low bid. Okay. And I noticed now that it wasn't uh, budgeted for this year or? Well, a million or so was in the capital improvement fund. Yeah. Uh, but really, the roof is more of a, a later thought. Initially, I think the plan was uh, that was in the CIP uh, was simply to capital improvement plan was simply to replace the unit, fix the HVAC problem. And this has been a problem since we completed the, uh, we basically doubled and rehabbed the Hudsonville facility in 2005. And uh, it's been a long term frustration for the occupants of that facility. Uh, the fact that it can get very, very humid in the summer. summer. Uh, when they make copies, the pages stick together if they come out of the machine. And it's, we've invested in other solutions over the years and finally landed on this as a way to finally fix it for good. Mr. Roebuck? Yes, sir. Mr. Terpstra? Yes. Mr. Bauman? Yes. Mr. Zylstra? Yes. Mr. Dannenberg? Yes. Mr. Meppelink? Yes. Mr. Garcia? Yes. Mr. Holtlor? Yes. Mr. Fenske? Yes. Mr. DeYoung? Yes. And Mr. Mr. Kyers? Yes. And Mr. Bergman? Yes. Motion passes. Appointments, none, discussion items. I would like to recognize um, the Ottawa County Planning Commission. On behalf of the board and the citizens of Ottawa County, I'd like to thank them for their service. And also just um, talk about some of the accomplishments that they've had over the years. They have implemented projects such as the countywide non-motorized pathway plan, the M104 corridor study, the 68th Avenue corridor study, the rural character and preservation guidebook, and several, uh, several countywide public transit feasibility studies. In addition, they have helped to launch the county's comprehensive groundwater study They've been instrumental in the creation of committees such as the Tree Legacy Committee, Broadband Steering Committee, Road Salt Task Force, and Groundwater Task Force. They've acted as a deliberating body in construction of the M231 bypass phase one and the adjoining Sergeant Henry E. Plant Memorial Pathway and Spoonville Trail segments. <clears throat> We've initiated the award-winning Urban Smart Growth Demonstration <coughs> Project that has helped to set the vision for and transform downtown Hudsonville. They've offered and hosted annual planning and zoning fundamental training to local units of government officials from counties across West Michigan. There are nine current members. Um, I think I have that list here someplace. Um, Rick Gajewski, Frank Garcia, Timothy Griffhorst, Terry Hossink, David Crocker, Ted Malfit, Kirk Hershenbacher, Nathan Pyle, and Doug Zylstra. In addition to that, there was 34 
past members, and I'm not going to read all their names, but I think it's uh, it's good to just stop and think about some of the things that they've done. So that's why I wanted to just make a list of um, some of the accomplishments that they've been able to have over the past few years. So their work has been accomplished and um, it's still ongoing work because it's now transitioned to um, several other uh, committees instead. So Al, report of the county administrator. Maybe you can elaborate on that a little bit. Yeah, sure, I'll be brief, just a couple of things, but also I'd, I'd also like to thank current and past planning commission members for their service. And I would also say that uh, in most cases, form should follow function. And when the planning commission was created, uh, one of the basic uh, duties that it had uh, was to uh, help uh, provide a forum and make decisions on zoning decisions that were made within 500 feet of a jurisdictional boundary. And that, that was requested to be ended a few years ago. And so that basic duty is gone. Also, when the planning commission was started, not all of our local units of government had zoning, uh, had planning and zoning functions themselves. They all do now. And so this group was partially created to help fill in the gap for those units that didn't have those uh, laws in place. And, and now they do. Also, I would say that when the planning commission was founded, we didn't have a parks commission or a housing commission. Uh, and that in fact, we recently reinstituted the housing commission. Uh, and the parks commission really deals a lot with, uh, you know, our environmental type uh, needs in the county. And uh, the Housing Commission was reinstituted due to significant concerns. We also didn't have PDR or the Ag Preservation Board, uh, and that exists now. So I think that you can see a trend where we need commissions more for specialized areas because of the complexity and the content of those areas. And so definitely you'll see a proposal uh, to take our, uh, much like the state has done in the past, but to take our ground, groundwater task force and, and turn that into a commission. So we need to look at the representation. Uh, I think there's some areas where we need to add some representation. And then I see that as probably a permanent need of the county going forward, having a groundwater commission because these issues aren't gonna be resolved in a year. I mean, they're gonna be with us and need attention uh, for the foreseeable future. And then the other area that's starting to receive uh, a lot of extra attention. In fact, we talked about it at our Lakeshore Advantage board meeting yesterday uh, is broadband and the fact that uh, COVID is maybe kicking everybody in the pants a little bit about making sure that, you know, it, uh, that there is uh, affordable access to broadband throughout the county and throughout our state and our region, because uh, <clears throat> you hate to see a situation where uh, a crisis shuts the state down and some kids are, have more advantage to continue their education uh, than others simply because of the quality or availability of broadband. And uh, many, and I, I believe this, I think broadband should be treated like a public utility, uh, no different than water or sewer or electric or gas uh, or what internet service has become in many, in some cases. Uh, but certainly I think it's the type of thing that should be readily available at an affordable price to every single person uh, so that everybody has a fair chance at uh, doing things like continuing their education during a crisis or supplementing their <clears throat> education. Uh, so I, I think we'll see movement on that in the greater community. I know the ISD is working on it. Uh, Holland Public uh, Works, uh, you know, I think this is a concern for everyone. So how that comes together, I'm not sure, uh, but definitely uh, be on the watch for that. Uh, the things will start popping with that. Also, I just wanted to, uh, you probably yesterday, maybe today, should have gotten your NACO newsletter uh, at home. And uh, that does have a nice uh, article on the county DEI program. So you may want to check that out if you haven't already. And I said I'd keep it brief, so I went too long already. So that's it for today. All right. Thank you. Next thing is general information, comments, or meetings attended. Commissioners? Mr. Chairman, everybody. You know, I wonder if you could just address that uh, the the public comment about the role of DEI in Allendale. What what have we done with the, the Allendale issue? And sure. Have we really involved the DEI office in that? Thank you, Commissioner. I, I was going to address that. That uh, that's good. Uh, okay. So you'll recall that when we created the DEI program, 
uh, we created it with a focus of operationalizing DEI within county services and then also working uh, with our local government partners. We did not want a conflict with LIDA because LIDA has a more of a community facing role. And uh, so we are more internally focused. Not to say that uh, we, Robin does field phone calls and does answer questions, uh, but as far as the county taking a front and center role, uh, we would view that more as a leader. In fact, I think my, my comment at the time we created the program was, if somebody burns a cross or writes graffiti somewhere, you won't be reading about Ottawa County taking a position on the front page of the paper. That's space that Lita has filled uh, in our county for a long time. So uh, that, that does continue to be our focus. Uh, I do know that uh, Robin has had communication in this case, but it's really more as a, hey, somebody call and bounce an idea off her and not with the county jumping into uh, that situation. Also, we will be moving forward in partnership uh, with our local units. Uh, you know, quite a few have, have expressed a desire to do that. And I think that uh, part of it is we certainly don't want to end up in a conflict situation in their communities as they have the wherewithal to deal with their own political issues. So that's kind of where that's at. Ross, Frank? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I wonder if I can uh, ask our county clerk to give us you know, just a, a minute or two uh, preparations for the election next week. How are we looking? What are you <clears throat> anticipating? Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Commissioner. Um, I can give you just some real quick stats here. I, I can tell you that 43% uh, of our registered voters have a ballot. Um, 1,678 people have returned a ballot. So that's 30% of our voters have already voted in the election. Um, and that's encouraging. We're doing uh, a, a lot of work in prepping and getting ready for um, the precincts to be prepared. But I think the encouraging note there is that our volume at the precinct is going to be significantly lower because of those 94,000 absentee ballots that have been issued. So um, yeah, we're we're doing well and uh, we're gonna stay strong for the next seven days. You're not anticipating maybe a three, four hour line wait or hopefully- I do not based on the, <clears throat> the numbers of people who voted by mail. I think one thing that we're trying to alert voters, make people aware of is the fact that um, because of the social distancing that's in place and some of the requirements that we're following with the six feet of distance in line, the line could appear longer than it is and that's what we've been seeing around the country too in some of these early voting locations in other states where they have physical early voting. The line looks long, but it's not uh, moving. It's moving quickly. And um, I just have every confidence in our local clerks as well. I'm very appreciative of our partnership with every one of them and they have done an amazing job. So. Okay. Thank you. Justin, I wonder if you could address the open carry issue uh, here in Idaho County. How do you see that and how do you see enforcement or non enforcement of that? It's been a, uh, a topic of heated conversation amongst uh, a lot of folks statewide. Um, there's nothing in election law that addresses firearms. Um, and we have never had a problem with open carry of firearms or firearms in the precincts. And so, what we're really reiterating to our election workers, and Sheriff Kempker and I have um, had a number of conversations, and I really appreciate. Um, Steve and Val and their whole command staff and their approach to this, as well as the other chiefs in Holland, Zealand and, and Grand Haven, and I've communicated with them as well. I think we're going to, um, I think I, I continue to just be impressed with this community. I think people follow common sense. Um, and I think our election workers specifically, we want them to know that they can utilize 911 and, and contact law enforcement if they or a voter ever feel in a situation where they're unsafe. Okay. And that is what we've conveyed to them. You know, we can let others worry about how issues are prosecuted or charged <coughs> later okay. on. Um, but if there's ever an incident where a voter or an election worker feels unsafe, we just want them to know they can call 911. And okay. um, the sheriff has been great in reiterating that and so has uh, you know the, the city law enforcement as well sure so in practice say there is a precinct and there is someone open carrying what will concretely be the, re the the response to that my understanding and again i'm not i can't speak directly for law enforcement but i do know that many in law enforcement around the state have not found a legal 
basis okay. for charging an individual. And so there, certainly in this case, there wouldn't be a response is what you're saying. I do know that a deputy would, would uh, show up if called okay. and maintain a presence in the, in the precinct in the okay. polling location and make sure that things were handled appropriately. Okay. And that, but, I can but that individual say. would not be removed is what you're saying. I don't believe okay. so. Anyone else? Oh. I, I, uh, <laughs> oh. <clears throat> I want to say several things about uh, tomorrow and the litigation um, that we're engaged in. First of all, I want to uh, compliment the commissioners today. I appreciated your the general nature of your questions, even though they were trying to focus a little bit on the public comment and things that were relevant. So I think you did a great job uh, in, in doing that. Secondly, I have been in direct contact with the Attorney General's office and the Governor's office. And they're not going to appear tomorrow because they haven't been served yet. Um, not sure why Libertas has not served them with process, but they, they wanted you to know that they're well aware of your political uh, constituency and your characteristics and the nature of the Ottawa County community. And they're very appreciative of the political pressure that uh, uh, this proceeding has in a certain sense on the board, but they want you to know that um, they think it's very important that we be consistent across the state with schools to keep them open with the masking and the gathering restrictions and the reporting, it's just as important in this case that the reporting obligations of schools and, and at some level parents are enforced here so that uh, Lisa can do her job and the health department can do their job to try to uh, find out um, uh, spikes <clears throat> and outbreaks and then deal with them as rapid as rapidly as we can. And so they understand these are the issues in the case and they appreciate Ottawa County's willingness uh, to stand with the rest of the state and trying to uh, make sure that there is um, adherence to these important uh, rules and regulations. Um, finally, I wanted you to understand that uh, in 1982, I got called into my uh, senior partner's office and he said, uh, we got Ottawa County as a new client. Um, and uh, we got, they have some problems with their clerk and their probate judge. And that was a brand new lawyer. <laughs> you were late back then. Yeah, I wasn't born. <laughs> and he said, uh, I know you went to the Christian schools. And I know you went to Calvin College. I know you're Christian Reformed. So you, you can understand these people. And <laughs> if I need interpretation at times when I deal with them, I know you'll be able to provide that uh, for me. And, you know, I've been Ottawa County's counsel in one <laughs> level or another ever since. And uh, I do reflect your values. Uh, I reflect the values of this community, which is why I'm still here some 38 years later. And I litigate with those values in mind too. Um, I have softened my request tomorrow uh, in front of the judge, um, given the fact that Libertas is finally respecting at least our cease and desist orders to the point where they're not um, holding in-person school, I don't want Judge Maloney's um, injunctive powers to be a possible bar to getting them <clears throat> reopened. And so I'm not at, gonna ask him tomorrow for an injunction against their continued operation. Uh, in fact, quite the contrary, my uh, argument tomorrow would be that we want to see Libertas return to in-person uh, <coughs> education as quickly as possible. We simply need to get a handle on what the size of any outbreak is there and to get some basic compliance with what we're doing so that we can stay safe and stay open in every school. 
And so I'm not going to ask for any injunctive relief tomorrow. I'm simply going to defend uh, the health department's actions. I think they're well within the constitutional <clears throat> limits and I, I expect that the court will not grant the injunction. And then he will leave us free to sit down with Libertas and, and work with them on getting them back into the classroom under the conditions that all of our other parochial, private, and public schools are operating in. We do not in any way to want to treat them differently. But by the same token, we want to make sure that they follow the same rules that everyone else is adhering uh, to. And I, I think that's what the school officials across our county want us to do, to be fair so that everyone's playing by the same rules. And they, because they deal with these pressures too in their own schools. And if it's out there that Libertas isn't masking or, or um, socially gathering, then that puts them under extreme pressure. And we're doing pretty well as the numbers show in these two age groups. And we wanna keep that despite our outbreak generally, we wanna keep it out of the school so they can stay open. And that will be my focus uh, with Judge Maloney tomorrow on those points and principles. And I think it reflects your values, all of you. And I want you to know that I'm sensitive to that and that I'll be advancing that. Thank you, Doug. Public comment. This is the second time this evening, um, this afternoon. <laughs> it's not evening yet. <laughs> <laughs> this afternoon that we have public comment. Is there anyone that would like to address the commission? Give us your name and your address, please, and limit your time to three minutes. Thank you. Um, my name is Justine Robinson. I live at 9324 Vic Leaf Drive, West Olive. Um, I just wanted to respond to the public comments earlier, which was really religious and filled with ideology, um, especially when referring to impinging, impinging their rights. Um, I just re want to remind this county what's been happening <coughs> last Saturday and every Saturday since June. I've been protesting the removal of Allendale the only racist statue in Michigan, which is in Allendale, and the removal of Brian Kelly, who is a real estate agent who sits on the planning board of Allendale Township. Uh, he's invited alt-right militiamen and white supremacists to these protests, including William Null, uh, domestically, sorry, recently charged with domestic terrorism in the kidnapping plot of Governor Rutsch, <coughs> of Big Grand, sorry, <laughs> of the governor. Uh, I asked this board to support the removal of Brian Kelly, the removal of Alan Ellen Voss, which is a supporter of Brian Kelly, and also take down the last statue, uh, the last racist statue in Michigan. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else like to address the commission at this time? On Zoom? Mr. Chair, we do have two comments on Zoom, it looks like. The first one is from Jen, and Jen, if you could just state your full name and your address for the record. My name is Virginia Greenlee. I live at 16731 Ashley Lane in Holland, Michigan. I have some questions as well as comments. First question, are you aware that the COVID tests cannot truly detect infection? They are sensitive enough to pick up on previous flus, colds, bacteria, other viruses, and even dead fragments of inactive RNA, matter, or debris. Again, they cannot truly detect infection. Infection per physiology, which is a, an area of science, can be proven by an increase in the white blood cell count. If you have a high white blood cell count, that means you have a fever, and your white blood cell count tells you you have an infection. That's a very common symptom. A live blood cell test can show an increase in the white blood cell count, but they are not doing those tests. <clears throat> and if cases do not meet infection, then that means you're not going to be contagious. Other symptoms are needed. Are you also aware that previous flu vaccines have never eradicated any flus? Are you safe from the common cold? Are you safe from the flu? Will you never catch either of those again? Nothing has ever prevented either the cold or the flu from being um, a recipient, being from somebody catching it. Our immune system designed awesomely by God 
usually can address a lot of challenges, but lots of times they may need additional support. But masking and a vaccine do not cut it. Hand washing has been for decades a very common sense practice to implement. Another question. Why should 99% of the survival rate be a threat? 99% of people can survive this flu-like symptom of this COVID pandemic. And finally, did you know that there is currently in process an international lawsuit that came out of Germany per section seven of the criminal code against this pandemic? This pandemic is going to be the biggest crime against humanity ever. And we will all hear about it in due time and it will be addressing nation by nation because this has been made into a mountain when it was just really a molehill, just a small virus similar to a flu that people have basically bowed to with not just fear, fear mongering, but panic mongering. So we need to get on top of this and be aware that people that do not have symptoms are not contagious. They may test positive, but that does not mean they have a deathly illness that 99% of the people survive. Thank you. Thanks, Jen. Who's next? The next uh, comment we have is from Carrie Bosma. And Carrie, if you could just state your address for the record. Hi, I'm just on here. I did not ask to leave a comment. I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> That is all we have right now. Okay. All right. All right. Then I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Support. Move and support. All in favor say aye. 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 Oh, same sign. Thank you. Okay. So you got a second. Okay.